And who's reading? <clears throat> Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that was given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace, through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe in this state. You should expect no good thing from the most high. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in there. That's downstairs, not paying a darn attention to the saints that are uh, watching in on the camera to the saints that, you know, what I'm saying uh, aren't able to make it. And the ones that we don't even know about around the world. Uh, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say about say to them is repent that they might live. So last week we talked about, you know what I'm saying? Let me get the let me get the scripture off of the screen here. Last week we talked about um let's see. Put it on the screen for y'all. So yeah, last last week we talked about Josiah. I mean, I'm sorry, not Josiah, uh Jehoaz, the son of Josiah. And then um, the king of uh, Egypt came. Because remember, okay, so let's let's recap a little bit. Remember, the king of Egypt killed Josiah. Josiah was going to war with him. He is like, yo, y'all told me I should be going to war with Assyria. You shouldn't be fighting against me. Turn your butt around. So Josiah pretended like he had turned around. He dressed up like he had just some regular old guy, came out and tried to fight against him, ended up getting popped, right? So Josiah, who was a good king, right? He was one of our good kings. He served the most high God. He did the right thing, but he ended up getting killed uh, uh, in this war. Then you had Jehoahaz who came after him, who was his son, wicked, right? The king of Egypt, that same king of Egypt, took Jehoahaz captive in Egypt. Kept him from, kept him uh, after, he, he reigned for about three months and he took him e into Egypt and he died there, right? After that, he put another uh, another gentleman in, in his place, his brother. His name was Eliakim, but the king of Egypt changed his name from Eliakim to Jehoiakim, right? So now our king that we're about to read about is King Jehoiakim. So let's pick up where we left off. What did we leave off with? Uh, were we reading Chronicles or were we reading uh, Kings? Who's reading Kings? Okay, let's do Chronicles then. We should be Chronicles 36. If we isn't Kings, we should be Chronicles 36. Give me verse uh Chronicles 30 uh verse give me verse one. Chronicles 36, give me verse one. <clears throat> Yeah, last week we also read about the prophets. I appreciate you, Sister Pamela. We read about the prophets. Um, we finished off with Joel, but uh, we also read about uh, Zephaniah, Habakkuk. Um, who else we touch on? Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Nahum we, we touched on a little bit, and Joel. And then we read a little bit of Jeremiah, right? So it's a lot of prophets, and we already know. Uh, you lucky I can't remember where it is. I want to say Amos, maybe it's a five. Um, but we already know the prophet Amos told us that, you know what I'm saying, when the most high God is about to move and shake, you know what I'm saying, he tells the prophets. Right? When he do a thing, he tell the prophets. So when we start seeing a bunch of prophets popping up, that kind of gives us a hint that something big is about to happen. Right? If you remember, uh, let me see if we can get it. Let me see. Uh, try Genesis. Is it 19? Maybe Genesis 19, maybe verse 9. And after that, we're going to go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 1. And they said, stand back. They said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. Evil needs to touch. Now we will deal worse than thee than with them. This is when they was. No, that's not it. Uh, Genesis 18, maybe verse 9. 
If it's 18, it ain't verse 9, though. What's the last verse in 18? It's probably verse like 23. 33. 33? So, it, I don't know. It's you maybe. Are, uh, let's see. You want 17. 18, 17. 17. This is Genesis. Uh, is se chapter 17? 18, 17. Uh, 18. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. Watch what the book say. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations on the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of Yahuwah to do justice and judgment, that Yahuwah may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Right? So after, after, I'll oh, keep going. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. All right. Now, the most, now we know what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The most I got burned that thing to the ground. He brought, he brought fire from the sky and burnt it to the ground, right? But before that happened, he asked himself, man, am I going to tell Abraham? And he decided, yeah, I'm going to tell him because I know he's going to tell his people. To do what I say. Right? Oh, we got grab uh Amos chapter three. Amos chapter three. Give me verse five. This is Amos chapter three, verse five. This is stuff that we already read, but it, I want us to keep it in memory, right? Because we see all these prophets popping up. We got to understand what we've learned already from the prophets. Abraham being one of the prophets as well. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where the gin, there is no gin set for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Mm -hmm. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord has not done it? Mm -hmm. Surely the God will do nothing but reveals his secrets and his servants, the prophets. Right? So he said, surely, Yahuwah, he's not going to do nothing unless he reveal what he's going to do to the prophets. So he tells the prophets first. So when the prophets get popping up and they get to making all this noise and telling us what's about to go down, we know that it's serious business. So that's what we, we tried to cover a lot of what the prophets said. Now we still have a lot to go. Right? We have a lot to cover with Jeremiah. And we're going to bounce around a little bit in Jeremiah as we read through these last few kings. Um, then we're going to get into some other prophets as well. So let's go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And let's learn about our king, Jehoiakim, right? He's coming right after Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz was taken out of his place by the king of Egypt. And then the king of Egypt is who appointed Jehoiakim, his brother, into, uh, into the kingdom, right? And so now let's kind of look at here, I'm going to switch the screen to where we can kind of see the lineages as opposed to just. Um, yeah. There we go. All right, so now we can kind of see the, the lineage. So you see after Josiah, he had a son. He had three sons, right? So from Josiah, uh, or these are three of his sons. I mean, he had more than three sons, I believe. But these are three of his sons. And uh, after Josiah, you got Jehoahaz, right? Um, and then Jehoahaz was taken out of his place. And he was given uh, a, a prison to live into, right? Then after that, you had Jehoiakim that was appointed by the king of Egypt, right? It wasn't even Israel who appointed him that he was appointed by the king of Egypt. However, he was truly um, heir to uh, Josiah, so he could become king, all right? So it was lawful, but he was appointed by an a, a outsider at this point. That's important. So let's read. This is Second uh, Chronicles chapter 36, verse 1. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was ninety and three years old, well, twenty and three years old when he began to reign. And he reigned three months in Jerusalem. 
And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. The king, and the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. And turned right, so Eliakim is the same name as Jehoiakim, or the same person as Jehoiakim, but watch what happened. His name was Eliakim, but watch this. And turned his name to Jehoiakim. And Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. And Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried, a, carried of the vessels of the house of Yahuwah to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations which he did and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiakim, right? So Jehoiakim, he, he came into reign. He was rebellious to the Most High God. And then the king of Babylon came against him. But this king of Babylon had a specific name. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. Right? So now Babylon is starting to assert its authority more and more. This is two times they've invaded our people, right? The first time, who was it? Who was our king? Uh, the, the one before Josiah, I think. Right, it was Manasseh. Yeah. Right, that was Josiah's grandfather. Right? So Josiah's grandfather, he was the first one to be invaded by um, Babylon. You remember they took him on fetters and put him in prison out in Babylon. Then they sent him back. The most, he, the most high God, he gave him grace. And they sent him back. And he repented from everything that he had doing. He started trying to clean up the land. Right? But that was the first time they invaded us. This is the second time. And the, the king is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is a big dog. Right? We're going to learn that Nebuchadnezzar is the one. We thought the king of Assyria was bad. Mm -mm. Nebuchadnezzar was that guy, right? In fact, Isaiah prophesied about Nebuchadnezzar. Let's go. Uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter uh, fourteen, verse one. All right. So if we look at, you know, what I'm saying, if we look at, if we look at our, uh, let's look at this. If we look at this and just look at the time period, right? Isaiah is way back here. Right? Way back here. Is that on TV? Oh, it's not on that TV. Um, it's way, way, way back here. Right? Then he's prophesying about a man that pop up right over here. So that's like 200 years. Right? 200 years in the future. He's prophesying about this king of Babylon that's going to be ruling the day. So let's see how it go. You said Isaiah what? It's Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1. For well, Yahuwah will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the stranger shall be joined with them and shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Mm -hmm. The people shall take them and bring them to their place. The house of Israel shall possess them in the land of Yahuwah for servants and for handmaids. That's they 14? Can... Yeah. Keep going. You want, um, I can keep going, but we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah. J jump me down where he prophesied the parable about uh Babylon. It should. Right. I thought it was right at the top. Was it verse ten? Mm. Yeah, he's like. Uh... It should be at the top. Yeah. 
You want, yeah, it starts at the top. We can start, we can keep going. <laughs> yeah. And the people shall take them, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahuwah shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear. And from the heart Hold on, they said the, they sound they said the sound is going in and out. Is it is it the sound overall? Like my voice is going in and out, or is it just T? Yeah, Really. Our video and sound frozen now. All right, well, let's try to figure that out. <clears throat> yes, yeah, seems good on my end right now. You said yours is good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm gonna try to switch my connection. Let's see what happens. You can still hear me? Yeah. All right. Oh, no, that's way worse. All right, it should be better now. <clears throat> Let me know if it keep uh, giving y'all issues. It should be better now. I'll switch the connection. Um, so keep going. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in that day the Lord will give thee rest from thy <laughs> from fear and from the hard bondage where you were made to serve. <laughs> that you shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How has the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath will, with, a continual, with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger and persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Right? So this is this is Isaiah prophesying. Go back up where he said the proverb of Babylon. Thou shalt take up the proverb against the king of Babylon and say. Right? So he told you this is a king of Babylon. At, at the time that Isaiah was prophesying, Babylon wasn't doing nothing. Right? So Isaiah prophesied this, and everybody looking like, king of Babylon, why are you taking up a proverb against him? Then 200 years later, Nebuchadnezzar walk in. He walk in, he take everything out of our temple, right? Let's jump back. This is 2 Chronicles. We're going to come back to Isaiah 14 in future studies, but let's go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, pick up where we left off. I just want y'all to see that. It's prophecies all over the place. So it's now we kind of look at this stuff like, you know, it's all kind of we read it all at one time. Right. But you have to you, you kind of have to see this from the perspective yeah. of our our ancestors. They would have heard this thing and heard about something from 200 years ago. It was written down and then they get to see some of this stuff play out live. Right. We go generations and generations without seeing real prophecy. So people. People make up prophecies, right? The power of the Most High God is not obviously seen, so people make up his power. That's why you see people saying silly stuff like, oh, well, you know, I'm blessed for God. He woke me up today. But you don't really see that in the book, right? If you, if you look in the book, more often than not, you see a man of God cursing the day he was born because he's suffering, right? 
But we 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 count it a blessing that the most high God wake us up in the morning. So we have to we have to lower the power of the most high God because we haven't seen it. A lot of people haven't seen it. So because of that, we minimize the power just because we want to see we got to we got to give we got to say something is happening. Otherwise, our own faith, you know what I'm saying, will, will be broken down because people really don't believe in the book. They believe in their imagination. Right. The average of these Christians and Muslims and Hebrew Israelites, they just believe in their imagination. All day we make assumptions about what the books say, make assumptions about who God is. And every one of us stand in the same spot. You know what we say? Lean not on your own understanding. That's what the books say. We all quote it and then turn around and just start leaning on our own understanding. Because it takes a lot to just let the book talk and they admit like, oh, well, really, I don't know. People don't realize how much that takes to just say, I don't know. Nobody wants to say they don't know. Everybody got to know. The problem is when you know too much and you wrong, you're not leaving. You're not leaving any room for the most high God to correct you. And the most high God to type is just like, OK, if you think you're right, go ahead. Right. We got to be humble and not the fake humble. Right. I'm talking about the real humble. The fake humble is like, oh, well, you know, you go before me. That's fake humble. The real humble is, like, I know who I am, right? I know I'm the king, but I'm going to still serve you as if I'm a servant, right? Real humility, you acknowledge the reality. You don't try to print, pretend and play. You acknowledge the reality, but you do the work, right? That's what we have to do. We have to admit, I don't know. That's the reality. But then you have to get down and do the work and try to figure this stuff out. Open up this book and look at it. People always ask online, they ask me, well, how, how, how exactly do you know? You know what I'm saying? It was, a, it, was a, it was a conversation going on online. They were saying, how do you know that, that your interpretation of the book is correct? They weren't talking to me. They were talking to another brother. And the other brother was like, well, the Holy Spirit, he, com he confirms it for you. Right? And so there's a lot of people that, you know, applauded what he said. Like, yeah, that's true. Baby girl. There's a lot of people that, that applauded it and was like, yeah, that's true. Because it is true. But the problem is, the next question needs to be, how do you know what spirit is guiding? But how do I know that spirit that's guiding me is the set apart spirit? You don't really know. Right? You really don't know. So the only way to really know, hold real quick. We're going to get back. But hold real quick. Go to Ephesians for me. Give me Ephesians been a while i don't know what verse ephesians chapter 6 verse i always like to choose nine nine is always safe for me it's ephesians chapter 6 verse 9 let's see what the book says it's, it's a lot of things that people don't understand the most high god has separated himself from us matter of fact before we get ephesians grab uh leviticus chapter uh 26 it's important for us to understand the reality of what we're dealing with. We are dealing with some stuff that most people do not understand. And more, more importantly, they won't admit it. They won't accept what's happening in reality. We won't acknowledge reality. We just lie to ourselves. Look, the it's... it's it's, listen, it is bad. It is bad to make somebody believe your lies. Right? It is bad. And it's bad to believe somebody else's lies. But it is devastating if you believe your own lies. Once you believe your own lies, you are lost. That's what it means to be lost. Because not only have you been convinced of something, you now follow it and don't even acknowledge the possibility that it's not true. Even though you've lied to yourself. 
you're lost at that point. Ain't nothing that can save you. If you believe your own lies, there's nothing else that can save you. So you have to be honest with yourself. That gives you a way out. It's Leviticus chapter 26. What I want, verse 42, 40 something? Uh, 40. It's Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40. What does the book say? <clears throat> if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me. They have to I confess that they walked contrary unto God and that I also have walked contrary unto them. And yeah. that God has also walked contrary unto us. That is important. Both sides of that is important. We have to, one, say, you know what? We've been rebellious to the Most High God. Then we have to turn around and say, oh, the Most High God been against us. Once you acknowledge that, then you can say, okay, it makes sense why I don't feel the presence of God. It makes sense why it's not a whole bunch of prophets coming to us and telling us what we should do. Why we don't have a standing leader that can raise our people up out of our captivity. These things make sense because why would the Most High God send somebody to save us when he's against us? So we have to acknowledge both of those that, one, we've been against God and God has been against us. And then after that, he says, then he'll come back and he'll remember the covenant for us. He'll remember what he promised Abraham. He'll remember what he promised all of our fathers. But if we don't get that through our head, if we still hold on to say, oh, well, I know I didn't mess up. I know I didn't. I didn't been through a lot and I didn't did some sinning. I'm a, I sin every day. God saved me. I tell you what, though, he ain't never left my side. What's that? What's that song? First, it was what's that? first. It was two sets of footprints in the sand. Then it was one set of footprints in the sand. Something, something, something. Stuff get hard. What did it say? Stuff get hard. How it go? You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember that song. What did he say? First it was two sets of footprints in the sand. Then it was one set of footprints in the sand. Times get hard. Something, something, something. God don't walk with me. He carry me, man. <laughs> <laughs> That was that God don't walk with me. He carried me, man. Just a just a sinning. But that's the idea that we had that. Oh, we just going through it and we committing all this sin, but God stuck with us the whole time. But that's that's a farce. That's not that's not what we have in our book. There's no reason to believe that based off of what we have in the book. So that's the type of myth that we start to we start to lean on our own understanding as opposed to leaning on what the book say. So now we look for the spirit to guide us, right? The question becomes, how do I know I'm believing the book correctly, right? And then we look for the spirit to guide us into the right direction. Okay, so I, I, the spirit is going to tell me. But the problem is the book say you have to test the spirits. So how do I know the spirit that's calling itself the Holy Spirit is truly the spirit? You have to know the book. This is uh this is Ephesians. Ephesians chapter six. I don't know what verse I want, but let's try verse nine. Ephesians chapter six. We're gonna do verse nine. Or if you see it, I want the armor. It's getting later and later in the day. You know what I mean? There's some people waking up and some people going further to sleep. You want verse 10? This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Watch what the book say.
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in our places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. stand so now listen, way. he's telling you about the evil days. He's telling you that stuff is about to get tough. Right? He don't even fully know what he's talking about. He just know that the Most High God gave him a word. And he's trying to explain to you, listen, what I heard from the most I got is about to get rough. I don't believe he knew exactly how it's going to look. He didn't know that we were going to be in the exact condition that we in now. He just knew, man, listen, it's, it's going to be some days coming. I don't know exactly when. I don't know how, but it's about to get real. Make sure y'all got the whole armor to stand up against the wiles of the devil. Right? So this is the time that we in now that we need the whole armor. Watch, watch how he characterizes the armor. Watch this. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Right? So faith for us is a shield, right? When we think of faith, we see, we know faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of Yah. And we also know that you show me your faith without works, I will show you my faith by my works. So when we talk about faith, we're talking about obedience. We are talking about adherence to the word of the most high God, right? Us behaving according to the word of the most high God is a shield to us, right? That then gives us righteousness. That righteousness also is a shield. It's a breastplate to us. It protects our body. So faith, behavior protects our bodies, right? Truth, right? Honesty protects our bodies. That's how you gird the loins. Right? Keep going. Having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So God now Lord. you have the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. You have to understand that this whole book was written by men who got the spirit that moved on them to speak. Then it was written down. So what we are reading is the spirit of the most high God. So, yes, it is correct that the, the set apart spirit does guide you. Right. It does confirm the truth for you. But the most high God is against our butts right now. Don't be sitting around waiting for no spirit. You don't know what that spirit saying. You don't know who that spirit is. Right. What you do know is, you know, what's written and everything got to line up by the book. Hold on. Hold on. We got real quick. Go to Isaiah. Then we're going to go back to uh, we're going to go back to Chronicles. Let's get Isaiah. Give me chapter eight. What do I want? Verse 16, I think. It's Isaiah chapter eight, verse 16. You want 20. I want what? I think you mean 20. I think um, 20. Yeah, I think 20, 20 is what I want, but. See, see, tell me where 16 start me. Uh, Sister Sharon, you got one more time to call me TD Jakes. 
That's disrespectful. Yeah, you on 16. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony. It says, bind up the testimony. When it says say testimony, it's talking about the book. So in other words, when it say bind, it's talking, it's talking you, ever, you ever had, like, you go to school and you get a binder? You know what I'm saying? And what you got to do? What do you do with your binder? You put the paper. Don't they got the rings on it? Right? So you take all the papers and you go and you put them inside the thing like this and you sling, you know, the little thing. I don't even know if y'all got it anymore. Y'all probably got some fancy stuff nowadays. But you take the little thing, be a little black thing, the hole puncher, and you go down and that thing go, you know what I'm saying? They put holes in that thing. Then you put it in the three ring binder and you put it in there and then snap it on there. You know what I'm saying? And then close it up and all your papers is all in one place. So instantly you had a bunch of loose papers and then you put it inside of the binder and what it turned into? Pretty much turned into a book. Right? So that's what he's telling. He's telling, bind up the testimony. In other words, it's going to be all these different prophets and all these different writings all over the place. Bring them all together and make them one. Bind them up. Put them in a binder. Right? So he said, bind up the testimony. That's talking about the Bible. Right? So bind up the testimony. What else? Seal the law among my disciples. He said, seal the law among my disciples. These boys don't know no law. I have to assume you don't know no law. You call yourself a Hebrew darn Israelite. Almost lost it. The dude online. He said, he said, well, Jesus Christ was the first. His, uh, he said, he didn't say first. He said, Jesus Christ was a Hebrew Israelite. I'm like, stop that darn lying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You ain't never heard the man call himself a darn Hebrew Israelite. Y'all say anything. You ain't never heard nobody call himself. You ain't seen nobody in the book call himself a Hebrew Israelite. Sound crazy saying that stuff. You just choose one. You either a Hebrew or you an Israelite. You know what I'm saying? You ain't got to be both. Why don't you relax? But I know we got we to gotta have some grace on our people because the reason why we do it is because these people have stole our identity. We trying to separate. We trying to make sure it's clear. I ain't no regular. Y'all, these y'all might call y'all selves Israelis, right? It's like, no, nah, it's not. No, no, no. I'm a I'm an Israeli and I'm actually Hebrew. I get why they're saying it. I don't want to be too harsh. I understand what they're trying to do. Right? You gotta separate yourself from these imposters. But at the same time, man, you ain't gotta. Man, I don't like, I don't like that other people get to claim our stuff and we gotta claim now we make up something new. That don't make sense. I'm an Israelite. Y'all call yourself whatever you want. They, they the ones that should be saying we Ashkenazi Israelites. They the ones that should be saying we, we Sephardic Israelites. Why I got to add something to my historical name when I own it? That don't make no darn sense. No, I'm an Israelite. I'm a Hebrew. I ain't got to say both of them. Right? So he said, bind up the testimony amongst my disciples. You're not a disciple. I don't understand how you even know what this book says. How are you? How do you even expect the book tell you right here? Bind it up among who? My disciples. And you still calling yourself a Christian? You walk around saying, "Oh, I'm a Southern Baptist Christian," or you a fancy one? Look, I'm non-denominational Christian. How silly you got to be, the man telling you exactly who he who he who he put the word in front of. And who he's selling it to, and you still call yourself something other than. You don't even look into the book and say, "How do I become a disciple?" When the book tells you, you never, you can't find one verse to tell you how to become a Christian. You can't find not one verse to tell you how to become a Muslim or a Hebrew Israelite or a Mormon or a Catholic or any of these other things that these people claim. You can't find one verse that tell you. I'll give you my darn life savings right now if you can find one Bible verse in the King James Version. Because you know, if I don't say King James Version, they going to go find it. You know, they'll find it in that, you know what I'm saying, new standard Christianized 2003 version. But it got to be from the King James Version. You find me one verse that teach me how to be a Catholic, where it say, this is what a man has to do to be a Catholic. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find because these people make this stuff up. But we adhere to it as if it's fact. 
not realizing that the whole time we've now made ourselves sealed off against the understanding of the law. And I tell you, if you don't understand the law, there is no reason for you to be teaching no book. A lot of these boys is teaching book and online posting stuff and standing in front of these churches or in front of these camps and congregation. And they have zero understanding of the law. Only thing they know is dietary law, feast days, feast days. We have to take our time with this stuff and learn it. That's why we go through and we look and we take our time on each one of our kings, on all of our history. And we look at it because this is the stuff that builds the foundation. When we learn the law, we learn it for as it's written. So now when we learn everything else, we don't have to make assumptions and guesses. It's very technical. Each thing lines up with the other thing and it all leads to each other. Most High God covers itself. You ain't got to make no, no leaps. Exactly what it says is what it means. People scared to believe a book like that because they know it challenged, it challenged everything that they thought they believed, everything they was taught, everything that these liars taught them. Let's keep going. He said, bind up the testimony amongst my disciples. What else? And I will wait upon Yahuwah that hides his face from the house of Jacob. And I will He does what now? That hides his face from the house of Jacob. So now, how are you going to get the spirit if he's hiding his face? How is the spirit going to confirm something to you when he's hiding him, his face from you? Sure, we can tell people that. We can tell people, well, yeah, the Bible say the comforter is going to come. It do say that. It does say that. Was that talking to you, though? Or is that talking to the disciples? So now we have to ask ourselves, how do I transition from who I am now to a disciple so that I do have the understanding of the book? The spirit is sent to the disciples to confirm the truth. Not to sinners. So the only way to do it is you got to bind up the testimony. You got to seal it amongst his disciples. Right? Watch this. Keep going. Now we'll look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahuwah has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahuwah of hosts, which dwells in Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, did not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? He if said what? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is how we measure everything. It has to be according to the word. Everything got to come back to what? Law and to the testimony. The law and the testimony. That's what we are, when we on the fellowship call. You'll see oftentimes we tie this stuff back to the law. We can't make no assumption. I can't make an assumption if the man tell me not one jot or tittle of this law will be done away until heaven or earth pass. And the law say what it is. I can't sit here and be like a brother was telling me the other day. He is like, uh, uh, he was like, oh, uh, yeah, the circumcision law. You know what I'm saying? That was changed. He said, no, he said, uh, he said, uh, it's a good brother, too. So I don't mean to demean him. But, you know what I'm saying, he's like the, the, he said the circumcision law, it changed forms, I think is what he said. It took a new form is what he said. And I'm like, that's something that we do because we know Paul said the circumcision mean nothing. So we try to reconcile that like, well, I don't really understand how, what role the law plays, but I feel like you got to keep the law. But then circumcision is being said, it mean nothing. So because we can't reconcile those two things and really in our mind, that's a contradiction. But instead of dealing with the contra contradiction and admitting, saying that's a contradiction, it's look, it would be better for us to sit here and be like, nope, the Bible is contradicting. Because on one hand, we got to keep the law and they say, 
you got to be circumcised. Then on the other hand, Paul is saying their circumcision means nothing. We should say that that's a contradiction in our mind because we don't understand it. That leaves room for God to say, oh, let me help you with your understanding then. But instead, what we do is we start making stuff up. So we say, oh, well, no, see, uh, it changed. How it changed? So now the law can change. But as soon as you say that, guess what? Now the Christian can come and say, oh, yeah, it changed. It changed so much we ain't got to keep none of it. And then our law loses its value to our people. Ain't nothing changed. The law is still the law. Let a temple get set up tomorrow and let a priesthood be set up tomorrow and sanctified and consecrated by the Most High God. You'll be doing sacrifices tomorrow. If a priest is sanctified and consecrated by the Most High God tomorrow, you being an Israelite, you will be doing sacrifices tomorrow while praising Yahushua. You will be praying to Yahushua saying, Father, thank you for sending Yahushua to die on the cross for all of my sins. Then you will stand your black butt up and you will take your you you will ride your darn donkey over to the temple and then you will take the goat and he'll be sacrificed for your darn sin. That's law. Yahushua ain't come to change that. People don't understand what the law is here for. The law came for our carnal bodies. When we sacrifice a goat, it's to prevent our physical body from dying. Yahushua ain't do, die. Yahushua's, oh, goodness. When Yahushua died on the cross, do you think he's, he, he died so that we don't have, die in our physical bodies? What sense would that make? What sense would that make when the man, grab, hold, hold we got right now, grab, grab, uh, grab John chapter 3, verse what? Give me verse 1. This is John chapter 3, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was... No, no, no. Chapter 3. Oh, John 3. One, one, one. <laughs> I don't know, Mary. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler mm -hmm. of the Jews. The same came to Yahushua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. Look, look at this, though. This is a Pharisee. Most of the Pharisees like, no, nah, we know it all. Right? He came to Yahushua by night because he admitted, I don't know. He's admitting, I don't know. That leaves room for the most high God to say, okay, I can work with you. As long as we walking around when we're wrong, acting like we know, there ain't no room for God to do nothing with us. It is okay to look at it and be like, it looked like a contradiction to me. Can somebody help me with this? It's okay to say something looked like a contradiction, even though you don't want to believe that the Bible contradicts. You would never, you're not going to, you're not going to have nobody teaching you the Bible that will stand up in front of you and tell you it is okay to think that the Bible contradicts because that's how you find out when it don't. You can't make up stuff to try to make stuff fit. The book don't need your help to fit. That thing fit perfectly on its own. You need the book's help. Right? So Nicodemus, he came to him by night, sneaking, because he knew, man, these other Pharisees, they know it all. I'm supposed to know it all, too, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I know this man is a teacher of, of the Most High God. I just can't reconcile some of the stuff he be teaching. Listen, I know this man is special, but some of the stuff he be teaching, man, I just, I can't make sense of it. Let me go holler at him at night. So he went over there. Let's see what the book said. Yahshua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I see, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, except a man be born, what? Again. You have to be born again. 
So if you were born once and then born again, what had to have happened in between that? Die. Everybody got to die. Keep going. Watch this. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born? And he entered the second time unto his mother's womb and be born. And Yahshua answered, verily, verily, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Right? Some people think that's talking about baptism. It's not. When he said being born of water, he's talking about a, a woman's water break. Right? So a woman water break and then you're born. And then you have to be born again by being resurrected by the spirit of the most high God. That is after death. Yahushua is telling you, you have to die if you want to go into the kingdom. Another place, the book tells us that flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom. So what Yahushua is giving us has nothing to do with our flesh. Whereas what Moses gave to us has everything to do with our flesh. And that's not a bad thing. A lot of times we read in the New Testament, flesh is used to talk about our desires, our, our wicked desires. I don't mean it in that context when I say flesh here, right? I'm talking about just our skin, our flesh and bones, our, our, our bodies, our physical bodies. It was made to govern it. It was made to help, help us eat healthy food, to keep ourselves washed and clean, and to make sacrifices that stood in the way of us dying. Technically, every sin should have a penalty of death. But the most high God, due to our, the hardness of our hearts, he said, I will allow for some sins for, a, for an animal to be sacrificed in our place. So for me not to die a physical death, I'm sacrificing the animal. As long as we have physical bodies, the sacrifices are still in play. As long as we got physical bodies, a priesthood, a temple, an altar, all that stuff. Yahushua did not change that. Everything that Yahushua comes for is in the spiritual. It's for the kingdom. It is not for our carnal bodies that we got right now. Our earthly bodies that we got right now. And until you understand those things, you don't understand the law. You don't understand what you're talking about. You don't have no place to teach. But I see these brothers teaching every single day not understanding what they teach it and they make a mess of it just sit down and learn where we at grab a uh, second chronicles chapter uh, 36 where we leave off uh, verse Eight. It's Second Chronicles chapter thirty-six, verse eight. Watch what the book say. We about to now learn about our king act. Jehoiakim. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and his abominations which he did, that found in him. Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiakim. Right. So hold on. Go back to Nebuchadnezzar. I want to hear again what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels. Of Go the back a little bit more. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he had many years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters and carried him to Babylon. Right? So now Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim, and he took him to Babylon, just like the previous king of Babylon did to Manasseh, right? So he bound him and he took him to Babylon. He made him a prisoner in Babylon. So now we've had two kings now. One, Jehoahaz, and he was bound and taken to Egypt. Then we have Jehoiakim, and he was taken to Babylon. Keep going, watch this. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar also carried up the vessels of the house of Yahuwah, to Babylon and put them in his temple of Babylon. Right? So now he also took items out of our, our temple and he carried those to Babylon. So he took our stuff. Right? 
And this is exactly what was prophesied back with Hezekiah. We don't have to go back and get it. But if you remember, Hezekiah showed the Babylonians everything. And Isaiah popped up to Hezekiah. He was like, yeah, yeah, what you show him? And Hezekiah was like, I showed him everything. He was like, okay, they're going to take all of it too. So this is the beginning of that. They didn't take all of it this time. They just took some of the vessels. So he said, okay, yeah, I'm going to take some of these vessels. And he took the king and they went to Babylon. Now we don't have, I don't personally have all the documents to support this, but why might Babylon have, have done that to, to Judah? Who were we paying tribute to before? We were paying tribute, uh, tribute to Egypt, right? The team, King Nico. So we were paying tribute to him because he took Jehoahaz and he appointed Jehoiakim. So Babylon was probably looking like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all paying tribute to somebody other than me? Nebuchadnezzar is starting to take control. He said, no, we shutting all that down. So he came, he got some of his money. Now, now, watch what, or, well, we don't have to watch. We're going to hold, we got, let's go to uh, Jer uh, Jeremiah chapter 35. This is Jeremiah chapter 35. The word which came unto Jeremiah from Yahuwah in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of Yahuwah, unto one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then right, I he said, that. Look, he said, Go to the Rechabites. Right, the Rechabites are descendants of, uh, of Moses' father in law, right, the Kenites. Right, so he said, go into the Rechabites. And you know what I'm saying? Bring them to the temple. So the Reg the Reg the Rechabites used to stay like in tents. You know what I'm saying? Like they kind of like they kind of like followed us into the land. They was kind of riding with us a little bit into the land. But they didn't really they they didn't really believe in like kind of like like having cities and you know what I'm saying? Kind of think of them like how you see okay. Amish people. Like the Amish people. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? They're kind of like the Amish people. So they, they, you know what I'm saying? They're like, you look at the Amish people, they restrict themselves and they, they got all types of rules and things that they just don't mess with. Right? And that's kind of how the, how the Kenites were, how the Rechabites were. Right? So let's, uh, let's, let's kind of look into what he's trying to tell them to do. He said, go get the Rechabites, bring them to the temple, give them their own chamber and give them some wine. Right? Watch this. Then I took Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Hab, Habza, Habzaniah and his brethren and all his sons in whose house of the record and the ho whole house of the Rechabites and I brought them into the house of Yahuwah into the chamber of the sons of Hanan son of Igbalia a man of God which was by the chamber of the princes which was above the chamber of Manasseh the son of Shalom the keeper of the door and I sat before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full in cups and said unto them, Drink ye wine. But they said, We will drink no wine. We will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye right? feel how. So the Most High God already knew they wasn't about to drink this wine. Not because the Most High God said that they couldn't drink wine, but because they father, right? One of their ancestors said, You nor your son. It was a family tradition. Don't drink wine. That was their family tradition. Right? Watch this. Neither shall ye build a house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Right? So they, they father also told them, listen, don't you build a house, don't plant no vineyards. You just live in tents. Right? Don't have nothing of your own. Just live in tents. 
Right? Keep going. Thus, we have made the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, and all he has charged us to drink no wine all our days. We, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, to build houses for us to dwell in. Neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwelt to Jerusalem. Then right. So they in. used to live in tents out in the desert. But then Nebuchadnezzar came stomping around. And we know that because he came into Jerusalem. But before he came into Jerusalem, he was stomping around Jerusalem. Right. So then Nebuchadnezzar, they running from him. So they run into Jerusalem like, yeah, maybe we can just kind of chill here for a little bit because it's getting hot in the streets. Right. But watch this. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and tell the men of Judah and the, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will you not receive instruction to hearken to my word, saith you? of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine or perform. For unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken to you, rising early, hearken not unto me. Also unto you, all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you, and to your fathers, but ye have not find your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the sons of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them. But this people has not hearkened unto me. Therefore, thus says Yahuwah God, the God of Israel, Go, oh, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. And I have called unto them, but they have not answered. Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus says Yahuwah of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he has commanded you. Therefore, thus shall the Lord, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Right. So now he blessed, he blessed the Rechabites who obeyed their father. And he called us out and he said, look, they obey their father, but y'all won't obey me. And I send prophets to y'all. I rise up early trying to get y'all to understand this stuff. Y'all just disrespect me. Right? But he said, man, they obey their father. He dead and gone. They still obey their father. This is, this, is, this is how the Most High God is viewing us. So he said, because of that, everything that I, everything that I prophesied, I'm about to do now. So this is Jeremiah kind of giving us a warning that it's about to go down. Right? The Kenite, the, the Rechabites, they thought they was escaping something. They ran in right where it was about to go down. So then we fast forward to what we just read in uh Second Chronicles. That's when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he takes Jeconiah. I mean, uh uh not Jeconiah, uh 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 Jehoiakim. Right. He took Jehoiakim and he takes him prisoner and then he runs up in our house. Don't think that that just happened like peacefully. That was a war. That was a fight. People got killed. So the Kenites is, just ran into a situation and ended up getting worse after they got there. Right. This is what we're looking at. This is this is this is the beginning of it. Right. You have you have one king, Jehoahash, taken into Egypt prisoner then jehoiakim was appointed after that babylon come take him prisoner take the stuff out of take some of the stuff out of our temple right and you got big bad nebuchadnezzar stopping around now i want y'all to know this is a bad man we thought all the rest of them was bad we thought some of the kings of egypt was that we thought we thought we were looking at the king of assyria no, nah, Nebuchadnezzar is better.
he's bigger. He's badder. He's harder. I mean, even in history, you read history and you learn, they'll tell you in history, Nebuchadnezzar was a bad man, right? The book is going to call him the king of kings, right? Uh, huh? The pamphlet said you still glitch. See more often now in the last five or so minutes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's causing it, but we at the, we at the end now. Um, so what we gonna read going forward? We gonna we gonna probably read chapter thirty six next week of uh, Jeremiah, and then we gonna go back and we gonna go into the next king, and the next king is gonna be um, uh, Jehoiachin, right? Who is also uh, I think that's Jeconiah also, right? So we gonna we gonna read about Jehoiachin. That Jehoiachin is going is going to be the son of I think Jehoiakim. Is that how it works? Jehoiakim, 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 the son of Jehoiakim. And yeah. then after Jehoiakim get out of the way, then Zedek, who is the brother of Jehoiakim, it's confusing, but um, yeah, I can't yeah. remember these things now. Yeah. <clears throat> Jehoiakim is the king now, but next his uncle will be. Yeah, so next we go into Jehoiachin, and then Jehoiachin, we put it on the screen here, and we're going <coughs> to make it. Yeah, so now we're going to end up going to Jehoi Jehoiachin, who is also Jeconiah, right? Then after that, it's going to go to Zedekiah. In Zedekiah's day, that's when, that's when the prophecy is fulfilled about us, you know, kind of... Uh, our, our uh, temple being destroyed, right? But we're going to go to Jehoiachin first. <clears throat> but we'll read about that next week. Until then, are there any questions? Hi, beautiful. Any questions in the chat? No questions in the chat. All right, no questions. Let's pray out. <clears throat>